He kōna e pūrangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. The year was 1999. They made us believe that we came up with the, uh, the, the name. We were in a studio. There was a selection of different names and words that were available uh, that New Zealand or international uh, musicians hadn't used yet. True was a word on its own that was still available. Bliss was one and a couple of others. And I remember it was either myself or, or Carly who said, why don't we put the two words together and form True Bliss? And ah, yes, True Bliss. Let's pick that. Kia ora, I'm Sonia Yee, and you're listening to Eyewitness, a podcast exploring events and moments in our history from the people who were there. And this time, we're dipping our toes into the 90s in a show that made music history. We're here at Simon Holloway's Beaver Studios because the record company wants the girls to put together a demo to hear what they sound like. The Pop Stars franchise was a precursor to other shows like X Factor and American Idol, but the reality TV show that had its eye on finding new musical talent all started here in little old New Zealand. And in this case, the hunt was on for an all-girl group, what would be referred to as New Zealand's answer to the Spice Girls. I'll see it. I'll, I'll know if I like it when I see it. Yeah, yeah. it's probably going to be a little bit nerve-wracking. The show broke new ground, transforming five girls, so Joe Cotton, Erica Tokash, Kerry Harper, Carly Binding and Megan Alatini into overnight stars. I tried to track down the girls, even Peter Ehrlich, but he was too busy. But I was lucky to find Megan Alatini. She's now an Air New Zealand flight attendant, but still works in the entertainment industry too. The writer that actually came up with the True Bliss concept, and he doesn't get enough credit for the fact that he was one of the founders, uh, Bill Taufer is his name, he actually came up with a concept after seeing his daughter at a school, um, no, it wasn't a school party, it was her birthday party. She was in her bedroom with four or five of her friends. They all had hairbrushes in their hands and they were pretending to be pop stars and singing and Bill was recording them. And it was through that that he then went to a producer to say, you know what, my little girls love to sing and they all think that they're superstars. How about we write a show around that concept? And and that's how it was born. So there was an advert in the paper. It didn't give much away about what was fully involved in the process of the show, but it was enough to get people excited was advertised in the newspaper article and, and my, my sisters and my mum said, you've got to do it, we'll take you to it. Because now, of course, that kind of advert would be on social media. There were no social media platforms back then, almost, thank God, I think now. <laughs> when it came to audition day, Megan was nervous. She'd performed in competitions before, but the excitement and tension around this one was huge. When I arrived at the town hall, I obviously didn't read the ad very well because I actually ended up on the main street of Queen Street, not knowing that uh, the main opening doors were actually at the back of the building, at the back of Altair Square. So when I arrived at the town hall, there were probably about 20 people, and I thought, oh, that's still a lot, and some people had music sheets and ghetto blasters and instruments, and here was me just by myself, not even knowing what to sing. And uh, it was a little while later that the organisers came to the front of the building to inform us that we were in the wrong place, that the, the line-up is actually at the back of the building. And so when I walked around the back and saw the hundreds of people queuing up and practising, I was so anxious and nervous and scared and really wanted to walk away. My baby sister, who came with me, she was there and she said, come on, sissy, you can do this. I stood in the queue and finally had the opportunity to audition in front of Peter Ehrlich and uh, Jonathan Dowling. Except Megan was so nervous that she drew a blank and couldn't remember the song she'd rehearsed. But there was one song that you could say was in her bones. Singing my life with his words Killing me softly with his song Killing me It's a song that my mum always loved to sing when we were much younger and uh, that was the Roberta Flack version that mum would sing to us. That was the only song that I could really draw upon at the time that I knew uh, my vocal ability would do justice and actually I could remember the words. (laughs) 
Well, I was so nervous and I knew that definitely came through in my voice and I remember talking to myself, come on, relax, you can do this because when you're nervous you have that quiver in your voice and I most certainly did that day. I knew it wasn't my best vocal showcase that day um, but quietly I thought I did okay. <laughs> Megan did more than okay. After about six to eight weeks of group auditions, she made it to the final 20 and then the final 10. She was told she'd have one more interview and that's a moment that changed her life. That was a wonderful feeling and experience and I felt also looking back like such an idiot because I started crying because I was so elated and I was thanking my family like I was at the Grammy Awards. (laughs) I mean, what was your impression of when you met the other girls for the first time? Because I think when you get girls together, I mean, and, and it's a new situation, girls can be quite competitive, but you're also sort of nervous. Here you are, absolute strangers, being thrown in the deep end. None of us really knew our vocal ability or capacity. Different personalities and dynamics were being displayed very quickly. It was definitely times where there was bitchiness that came into play, competitiveness over who's got a nice body and who doesn't, who's got long hair, you know, just stupid, silly girl things, you know. None of us really knew what we were in for, and so we were all doing things by default and would really lean in on each other. And, you know, at the time, remember, pop stars was one of the first of its kind. Now, looking back, I know that they would have set certain things up to appear a certain way. We now know for a fact that sometimes material was taken out of context, again, so that it made for an entertaining show. And sometimes we just forgot that the cameras were even there. Megan says an unavoidable obstacle was dealing with tall poppy syndrome. I'm so disappointed that the tall poppy syndrome is such a part of our culture, and um, it was then. You know, they would often question whether we were actually singing, query our, our vocal ability, and have opinions about what we wore or how we looked. I remember feeling so insecure and not quite worthy enough, and my confidence was really low at times. People would write into newspapers or magazines instead of the new social media platforms like we have it now. And I remember just feeling so deflated sometimes by people's opinions. Um, And then when we weren't performing or when we weren't out there, it was like, oh, where are you guys? What are you doing? And there were times I, I, I would say to people, what do you want? When we're doing great, you want to mock us. When we're not around, now you want us back. Unfortunately, I see that happening time and time again. I see it now even with my own children. I do think that the media plays its part there and can direct, manipulate or drive things into a certain area, just like we were at the time of our project. You know, when you touch on something that may soul destroy someone, for me it's all about the purpose and or the intent. What is it really that you would like that outcome to be? This is just for the feeling of what I'm thinking. Like. This is an episode from Pop Stars where the question of the band's style is up for discussion. What will they wear? Who do they want to be? And is everyone going to get on board? Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting these are the actual clothes, but it's just the kind of feeling, you know? Skateboard style is really now. Roughy, westy look. <laughs> westy meets homey. Westy meets homey. <laughs> <laughs> I won't want to be around when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh my goodness, first of all, I don't know what we and our stylists were thinking sometimes when it comes to that costume selection, and I must say we had a really, really great team who looked after us beautifully, um, and it wasn't actually the choices of the stylist sometimes that um, was not so wonderful, it was actually us thinking that we knew better. Um, I think it looks scruffy. I know that that's the look these days, is to have kind oh, of a uh, mismatched looking scruff, mm. but... I'd never go home wearing that to my mum. I'm looking at the whole thing and going, no. What's your idea, Peter? Because you sort of like have a bit of input when it comes to our I do remember it was a time where glitter and the sparkly bindies were a thing and usually girls would have one, you know, right in the middle or they might have two on the side of their eyes. 
I decided I will go the full haul and I had them all above my eyebrows and in the middle, purple and the um, the clear ones. Really, I was taking a leaf from some of my drag queen friends who, you know, were always fabulous with the big lashes and all. But I took it to the next level and I ended up looking pretty tragic. <laughs> oh, it sounds like you're ready to go to a rave, an outdoor oh. rave. <laughs> we look back at it now and I go, oh my gosh, PVC vinyl pants, you know, and we're under lights on stage, sweating our guts out. <laughs> crop top so that everyone could see our little tummies and then Joe would be like, really girls? You know my fat guts is not going to work with that. And we were so selfish sometimes with the way that we looked at things, you know? So I now look at it and I think, gosh, we were inconsiderate of each other sometimes and a little bit selfish. And again, it comes down to, you know, just being young and dumb. Did any of you girls have um, any input into like song choice? We really wish that we did have the opportunity to have more say and more input. I have a feeling that it took us three weeks to record a full album. We had a songwriter, Anthony Yuasa, who was just so clever and was able to turn songs around for us really quickly. There's a lot of pressure on the girls right now because the music industry in New Zealand is very small and everybody's going to be watching their every move. I remember watching an episode of the build-up to their debut performance. It was going to be huge. Or at least that's what we were led to believe. But when the concert started and the audience piled in, they were young. And I mean really, really young. There were eight, nine, ten, eleven-year-olds screaming their lungs out. And then we had the extreme of the over 30s because, of course, they would come with their parents. True Bliss was sponsored by Pepsi and Burger King and toured to 17 towns up and down the country. They got to sing the national anthem before the Bledisloe Cup game in 2000. They also had a number one single on the New Zealand charts with their song Tonight and three singles in total released on Columbia Records. But after the show ended... Things for the band didn't live up to the girls' expectations or what had been planned. I was really disappointed that the show concept was taken over to Australia rather than the original idea, which was for us as a band and and our TV show to go over to Australia and then it formulate from there. So we were a bit disappointed about that. The band were together for just over a year before breaking up. Stories floated around the media about how the girls felt financially cheated. And even Megan mentioned that they were just naive and young at the time. But what the show did was lay the foundations for other opportunities for the girls. Erica Tokash went on to present RTR Countdown for four years until 2003, and she's now a stunt coordinator in the film industry. Carly Binding publicly distanced herself from True Bliss. She carved out a name as a solo artist with her debut album Passenger, which peaked at number six on the New Zealand charts and also went gold. And she toured South by Southwest in the States in 2007. Kerry Harper lives in Taupo and now owns a couple of building companies along with her husband. Joe Cotton's been working in the entertainment industry as a radio host for More FM. And Megan scored a role as an actor in Cloud Nine's The Tribe, among other things. Ebony's most insecure when it comes to the men in her life. According to Megan, the girls are still friends. They even perform together, minus Carly. I found this one from 2015, where they're saying at Tirahana Estate. When I'm at bars, restaurants or nightclubs now, it's those very 28, 29-year-olds that come and support us when we perform, and I'm like, OK, that's better. We've got an older audience now. <laughs> all I can say is I'm really proud that all of us girls have held our heads up high, even at times where it was really, really difficult to do so because of the backlash that came off the fact that it was a manufactured TV show band. But if I'm completely honest, even to this day, it was one of the best experiences I've ever been through. It has been such a learning curve for me. Even now I can, you know, really reflect back and think, ah, I'm now able to deal with my life in a certain way because of the True Bliss and Popstars experience. And if nothing else, 
it um, helped me form bonds and friendships that are lifelong. And so I'm really grateful for that. Uh, because of the show, I've worked as an actress. I had the opportunity to be on Dancing with the Stars, um, a judge on New Zealand Idol. And I don't know if any of that would ever have been possible for me had it not been for the pop stars and True Bliss experience. And it's something that really catapulted in the whole media world as something so new that now is a you know, it was a phenomenon then. Now it's a norm. And to have been a part of that, I think, is, is pretty special. And you take the good with the bad. Pop stars went around the world to places like Argentina, Denmark, Austria, Ecuador, Belgium, Belgium, France, Canada, Germany, Romania, Russia, Mexico, Tanzania, Malaysia, Kenya, Kenya Turkey, the Netherlands, Indonesia, Norway. Ireland. And that started in little old New Zealand with a little band, True Bliss, through pop stars. Um, and if you were to ask me if I would do it again... Stupidly, I would say yes. Even, even <laughs> all of those bindies. Uh, 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 maybe, maybe I'll have less bindies on. And in other news, the Pop Stars show is making a comeback on TV screens in 2021. So, who's going to be the new True Bliss? That's it from me, I'm Sonia Yee, and you heard Megan Alatini. The sound engineer was Phil Bench, and our executive producer is Tim Watkin. If you'd like to listen to this episode again or anything else from the Eyewitness podcast, head to rnz.co.nz forward slash eyewitness. Alternatively, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Radio Public, or wherever you get your podcasts. Catch you next time.